Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Lucy Heavens, and I am VP of Marketing at Hokodo. So over the next 45 minutes, we're going to be uh, digging into the world of marketplaces um, and looking at some of the challenges uh, that this fast growing industry has faced. So a couple of quick um, housekeeping points before we start. Um, firstly, the format for today's uh, webinar is a panel discussion. So I'm going to be having a chat with my lovely guests here today. Um, we've allowed plenty of time for questions, so please type them in and we will address them as part of the conversation. And then lastly, a um, recorded version of this webinar will be um, available after and sent directly to your inbox after we've finished. So to um, set the scene here, we've seen quite a rapid growth of, of online marketplaces, and um, which is showing no signs of slowing down um, with the likes of eBay and Amazon that are leading the way. Um, so many B2C marketplaces are popping up around the world and um, to satisfy this consumer demand for a more reliable and, and, and affordable way to shop. Um, and the B2B marketplace um, area is, is no exception. So B2B marketplaces grew 7.2 uh, times faster than all B2B e-commerce as a whole. That's massive. So there's a huge amount of potential here. But as we know, scaling a marketplace isn't easy, especially in, in the, um, you know, the uncertain economic climate that we're in right now. So at the risk of sounding like Mrs. Negative here, um, there's a significant number of challenges that are faced uh, by B2B marketplaces along their growth journey. So thank goodness I have a bunch of experts here with me today. So with years of experience and expertise between them, um, my guests have seen firsthand the many mistakes that have impacted the marketplace's uh, growth journey. And they're kindly gonna share some insights with you today so that you don't have to make the same mistakes. So let's kick off with some introductions. Um, so when I um, ask you to introduce yourself, um, could you please give your name and your job title? And also um, what a marketplace means to you. So what, what's your kind of definition of a marketplace? Um, Louis, would you like to start? Yeah, sure. Hi everyone, uh, very happy to be, to be here tonight. So I'm the co-founder and co-CEO at Hokodo. Uh, at Hokodo, we help merchants and marketplaces grow faster by offering better payment terms to their professional customers. So it's all about you know, how do you give payment terms, credit terms to your customers and therefore allow them to enjoy a better uh, purchase experience. And uh, when you talk to me about what is a marketplace and what it evokes, um, it always, I grew up in Champagne in France and uh, Champagne used to be the, you know, the, the marketplace of uh, Europe between the 5th century and the 15th century around that, uh, that time. And that's where you had dozens of sellers across Europe meeting hundreds of buyers. So coming from, uh, you know, uh, Asia, Italy. Uh, Germany and all gathering in that place and it's funny because it happened usually over three or four weeks and you had one week for discovery getting to know your buyers finding what you wanted to buy and then one week for the transactions themselves then one week for settlement and shipment and it's funny to think that with uh, you know technology all of that stuff now happens in uh, just a, a, a few minutes but you know i've always been passionate about platform business models and marketplaces have brought together people for for centuries and uh, the story is just about to to begin fantastic thank you um mark yes hi everyone um so i'm uh, mark Telliers. Uh, with Miracle, and I lead the customer success team uh, dedicated to our B2B clients globally. So Miracle, we're a software company, a SaaS platform, and we help basically uh, operators that run a marketplace to facilitate transactions and, and orders between buyers and, and third-party sellers. And our software also helps to uh, onboard at scale uh, curated sellers and, and, and products. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, I, I love your, your uh, analogy of uh, what a marketplace uh, is, Louis. My, my, my definition is that it is basically a, a digital platform uh, that facilitates basically transactions between buyers and third party sellers, right? Mm. And it can have different shapes of forms uh, and different uh, legal constructs uh, underneath. 
you know, uh, some, you know, it could be a dropship platform. It can be what we call at, at Miracle, a one creditor. It can be a traditional marketplace. In the end, it doesn't really matter. That's, I would say, a secondary choice. Uh, but once again, it's a place where people meet to make transactions. Mm -hmm. right. Back Thanks. to the basics. <laughs> um, Pierre. Yes, hello, everyone. I'm super happy to be uh, part of this discussion. Uh, because if there is something that I'm super uh, interested in, it's marketplaces uh, problematics. I'm the uh, chief growth officer uh, of MangoPay since the launch of MangoPay, so 10 years ago. And we actually have built one of the most complete payment solutions uh, to cover the needs of a marketplace and uh, the needs are very different from uh, e-merchants, I would say. Uh, maybe we will discuss that a little bit uh, later on, but our choice from day one in terms of technically and regulatory speaking was to really address the problematic of marketplaces. Uh, what we consider as a marketplace uh, at Mango Pay. Well, it has been the same for thousands of years, which is it's a safe place. So the market where, where buyers and sellers feel confident enough to exchange money, exchange transaction, exchange products. Um, and more and more, I have to say, we don't speak too much about marketplaces, but about platforms, just because even e-merchants are also going on the marketplace uh, business side and so we like to say that we our our mission is really to enable any kind of platform business model uh, to to operate yeah fantastic i love that i love the kind of the safe place for the for yeah. them to to transact i think that's we'll come on to that and unpack that a little bit later because yeah if you were to meet any of those sellers on the street as you were walking past as they were selling things i don't think you'd have quite the same um, experience or trusting them would you so <laughs> so um thinking about the the kind of the title or the theme of this webinar what we're here to do is to kind of un, un um, is to look at the experiences that you guys have had um so what i'd like to ask first of all is um in your experience what are the most common mistakes that you've seen that prevent marketplaces from scaling their business um pierre can i come back to you first uh sure 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 so uh i think the first uh uh, thing that is super important to check is really to make sure that you are not uh, imagined. And the reason why I'm saying that is totally different if you are designing shoes or if you're building a flower shop online, um, you basically gonna have very basic digital needs to launch your business. But when you are building a platform, a marketplace, suddenly you realize that you will have actually very different problematics. Legally speaking, because of course you cannot uh, have money of your seller on your bank account because you're not a bank, okay? And the law across Europe and now even across all the regions of the world is here to really protect uh, what we call the third party, which is you as a platform, you are just enabling transaction and exchanges on your platform, but you have some strict rules under which you have the right or not the right to do, okay? And so I think the very basic thing when you're starting your business model is to say, hold on, I am just selling things and then I have suppliers, then you are an e-merchant, easy. Or do I let third parties like seller using my platform to get in touch with even more buyers? And then you understand you are not an e-merchant. Okay, you become to be a marketplace, a platform, and you can have tons of different third parties. Actually, you have buyers, sellers, sometimes you have insurance on your platform. So a lot of people that will be part actually of, of one transaction. So I think that the very first part is to do your assessment to really check. And uh, most of the prospect that we meet sometimes, they're not sure if they really belong to the e-merchant business model or the platform uh, business model. And once you acknowledge that, uh, 
You really have to do your homework on what legally, because that's what you have to start to do very first, legally, what is your obligation as a platform? Because you will need to uh, securize, okay, to secure not only the payment, but also who is transacting on your platform. And just to finish on that, if you are enabling other sellers to be part of your marketplace, maybe you want to check who are these sellers. And then it's not just about payments, it's also about knowing your sellers, scoring your sellers, and doing the legal work of uh, the know your customer obligation on your platform. So I know I'm a little bit, I always speak about payments and KYC and regulatory part, but if you don't do this homework from the very beginning, then you will have a problem to find the right partners Okay, to be able to build your technical platform, and that's super important. Oh, that's great, thank you. And um, Mark? Yeah, I mean, just to, to piggyback on, on what Pierre said, I would even add that the earlier you start this uh, process, the thinking on what are the legal obligations, uh, what are the implications related to, to payments, the better, right? And 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 one of the mistakes that I've seen is people who start thinking about those matters too late, and it just delays delays uh, mm -hmm. a lot the project, right? Yeah. So uh, what what Pierre said uh, uh, may seem like you know uh, uh, lots of details, but it's absolutely fundamental, right? Um, just to 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 add um, more, I would say on the strategic side, well, I will paint two extremes. Um, which which are actually mistakes that I, that I see uh, from time to time, especially in B2B. Extreme number one is people who will adopt, I would say, what I call the proof of concept approach. So they would actually start with, okay, let's test our platform just with a handful of buyers, right? And let's just bring a, a couple of sellers and, and let's start with, I don't know, 100 products. The answer is very simple. It, it will not work, right? Um, because um, basically, I mean, you will not do enough business, uh, and especially if you bring that, uh, if the idea, which is you know uh, the, the, the best idea, uh, which is to bring your marketplace on your on your core website, if you basically just bring a uh, hundred products and you already sell, uh, I don't know, a hundred thousand products, the likelihood that your buyers will find your product is very little, right? So mm -hmm. you need to have a minimum scale. Uh, to, to do business. On the other end of the spectrum, though, there is the uh, let's shoot for the moon uh, approach uh, right away, right? Where you try to have the best marketplace, the best customer experience ever right from the beginning. Uh, first of all, it's unlikely that you achieve that right from the beginning. Uh, so you may actually uh, delay uh, a lot your, your, your project. Um, so what we... Um, you know, what we recommend is from a technical standpoint, what everybody knows, uh, which is, you know, minimum viable product. And, and mm -hmm. from a business standpoint, we have the, the mirror of the MVP, which we call the MVE. So the minimum viable ecosystem, which is in a way, uh, you know, what's the minimum set of buyers and sellers that you need to do business at a reasonable scale, right? And as you can imagine, there's no absolute numbers, there's no right or wrong answer, but it, it's something that is very important to to think about when when you launch absolutely yeah um louis any thoughts from you yeah so uh, scratching my head because already some good points have been made <laughs> uh so if i were to add uh, a couple of things we've seen uh in the you know in in the marketplace ecosystem in the past years is trying to grow too fast the marketplace and at the beginning, letting everyone come into the marketplace, because obviously the bigger the network, the more attractive your marketplace is, but then having some unreliable suppliers or some flaky buyers join the marketplace. And then you do, if you don't have enough curation with just a few individual companies on that uh, in that marketplace, you can actually damage the economics and the value for everyone. So if you have a supplier who's uh, you know delivering the goods late or 
that are uh, damaged, there are disputes, then that's going to be, uh, you know, that, that's going to be a real, a real issue. And similarly, if you have buyers who are doing chargebacks and so on, that's creating a lot of hassle. And back to what Pierre was saying at the beginning, decreasing the trust and perception of safety that your marketplace is creating. And at the end of the day, one of the fundamental value adds of the marketplace is about, you know, trust. And uh, it's about trust. It's about convenience. But if you undermine the trust early on, you know, you only have one reputation. And it's going to be tough to to claw your way back. Um, then another another one that I've seen, which is a bit counterintuitive, but it's similarly in that desire to propel your marketplace and to grow uh, very quickly in the early stages. Uh, we've seen several marketplaces that have started operating with a very low take rate, so charging a, only a small commission. And that actually constrains you because you put your you know, your buyers and your sellers in a world where you're not charging the right price for your services and you're going to endanger in the long run your monetization model. So that's going to make future funding rounds uh, or future sustainability an issue. And for many marketplaces over time, there's a roadmap of, you know, bringing more services into the platform, whether it is a payment, financial services, logistics. And if you only have that tiny commission that you can feed off, that's just going to make everything more difficult in the long run. So I'd say, you know, in, especially in the early stages, daring to be expensive would be, uh, uh, you know, might slow you down a little bit, but in the long run will be a big enabler. Yeah, absolutely. That's a really good point. And actually, we've kind of um, gone into the second question then a little bit that I was going to ask, which was around, you know, you you said that marketplaces have grown big and fast. And that's the key, isn't it? They, you know, they, yeah, they've, they've just grown sort of super, super quick. So in your view, what is the most important thing that marketplaces need to do to succeed? Like you've measured there, think, have that growth in mind right from the start and thinking about your pricing model and things like that. Um, but there, are there any other kind of tips that anyone's got about putting things in place earlier rather than later that's um, the million dollar question lucy <laughs> what, what will we get if secret? we answer it <laughs> I, I, maybe I, I can share a few a few thoughts just thinking back about the the definition at the beginning you know we, we all had a very pragmatic definition which is it's a place it's a digital place where buyers and, and sellers meet so it, it's it's in the end it's very important when you launch a mar and operate a marketplace to always think about your buyers and your sellers. So to, to, to me, the first thing is, let's think about the buyers. Who are they and, and, and who are you trying to target? Are you rather trying to gain new buyers, new customers, or to better serve your existing customers? Are you rather serving like small and medium businesses or very large businesses, right? And, and your, your marketplace, your platform will have a different shape uh, depending on, on the answer. What are the unmet needs or the pain points you are trying to address, right? Uh, is it that buyers want, you know, a single place, a one-stop shop to, 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 to buy everything that, that, that they buy from multiple uh, places today? Uh, uh, so that's, you know, thinking about who are the buyers and what are their needs is, is the first thing to do, right? Second, on the other hand is, okay, it's, you need to think about the, the offer, the seller. So the category strategy is, is very important. The general rule is that the closer you are to your core business, the more you will sell, right? So if you, I don't know, if you are a food and beverage uh, 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 wholesaler and you decide to sell electronics, I mean, it may not work really well, right? But if you start to sell, I don't know, uh, beverages, maybe it will work better, right? And the third point, which will probably be a segue to, 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 to Pierre and, and Louis is that then, I mean, in the middle, your market needs to be nice, right? It, it, it needs to have a nice roof and, uh, you know, a nice, uh, to, it needs to be welcoming. So the, the customer experience need, needs to be great. And in particular, uh, all the matters related to invoicing, to pay in uh, and, and pay out needs to be uh, very carefully uh, thought of. 
Yeah, but to add upon that, Mark, it's funny that we always come back to how trust is important, right, uh, on, on the platform. Even if you're not um, just a new player on the market, but maybe you want to digitalize uh, your service and uh, you want to actually accept a lot of sellers online. Uh, what I've seen so far is the, the trust also comes from the fact that you really know and you have an expertise on your market. So more and more what we see, except for some top big ones, very recognized, is very specialized marketplaces, okay, of all kinds. It pretty much cover the entire sector of the economy. So you have C2C split it in 100 different kinds of specialization, uh, same for the B2B, etc. But the reason is, each marketplace wants to show that they know exactly you know, their market. They know exactly how to select the seller on the marketplace, which is super important because when you are a buyer and specifically in B2B, but more and more in C2C, you want to make sure that when you're making a payment and a large order, you can trust you know, this, uh, this seller. Uh, and the specialization also comes to the fact that the marketplace should bring some specific service and added value instead of just buying on Amazon, right? Because otherwise you can find everything B2B, C2C, you go to Amazon. But what we are saying here is, and the proof of it is that it's very successful because there are tons of marketplaces that are created now that are specialized and what they give to their audience, both the seller and the buyer, is really some value added services. Uh, sometimes it's related to a product like Okodo, for example. Uh, sometimes it's related to specialists of marketplaces like uh, Miracle. But at the end, the goal is that you feel super confident as a seller to make the effort to onboard your product and it, you know, it can be complicated. And you also feel super confident that the buyer in front of you are um, uh, trustfully. And the, the other parts I like Louis, when you said uh, uh, some part on being global from the beginning, et cetera. I think what is important and sometimes it's hard to explain from the start, you have to think global so you don't have to change your platform year after year when you open a new country etc but from the very beginning you have to start small right so you have to think of the long term at the same time how will i be able to onboard thousands of sellers and and, and buyers but to start you have to think let's focus on the right tiering of seller okay maybe at the beginning you will not have uh, the most famous seller on your platform, if you are B2B, okay? But you, if you target it well, then you will be, you know, super confident to target bigger seller on your platform. And for this bigger seller, then the problems arrive with, they want you to be global, they want you to do cross-border conversion fees, etc., and more service. So that's that's how I see it. Yeah, I was going to ask a similar question and picking up on what, what Louis said about the kind of going global. I mean, obviously, that's the benefit of having, you know, the more traditional marketplaces that you mentioned in Champagne, you know, going online, obviously, access to, you know, more services and more goods and everything like that. But there's also a layer of complexity in the back end when it comes to, to payments there and, and those sorts of things. It's not just a case of handing over, a you know, a, um, a £10 note to, to the seller anymore. So, um, Louis, can you talk to me a little bit about that? you know how do we simplify the the that that kind of complexity around the payments yeah well that, there's definitely something to it and what's uh what's fascinating is to see that you know not all marketplaces were handling the payment piece because it's so so complex um and in particular <laughs> you know they want to build a software product that scales across multiple countries but contrary to uh, you know a basic product having payments means that you also have different regulations to to deal with and the, especially like you know for instance when you start to introduce uh, payment terms credit terms you may have a financial a financing component that comes into your marketplace 
And then the regulation for financing for lending is different in France, from Germany, from the UK. And it's not because you've cracked it in your home market that it's going to work across uh, across all the um, all the other territories where where you want to operate. So there's uh, there's really something particular, you know, around fostering trust in your marketplace and managing to bring payments inside your environment is you know, a big enabler to how much you'll be able to, to monetize in the long run. Because when you think of it, there's something really specific for a B2B marketplace, which is uh, both Pierre and Marc just made a point around product market fit. And you need to have something that's so compelling that buyers and suppliers come onto your marketplace. And a big, big risk that every marketplace faces is the risk, and it's even more pregnant in B2B than in B2C, it's the risk of, uh, of bypass. So, you know, when you have a, a B2B buyer who finds a great supplier, and then suddenly they're like, oh, you know what, we could do our next transaction off the marketplace mm -hmm. and, um, and not pay the commission that we pay to the, to the intermediary. Well, one way to avoid this is to actually create so much value on the marketplace beyond the discovery that people want to stick to the marketplace and not go outside and bypass you. And one way of doing this is to inject some additional services like payments, like financing, like logistics, that people will struggle to reconstruct outside of the marketplace because they don't have that uh, trust element they haven't cracked the cross-border intricacies that your marketplace may have solved for them. So that's why managing to repatriate the whole payment cycle, so pay in from the, the buyers, pay out to the, the suppliers, and if possible, with payment terms that give trust and uh, you know, liquidity to everyone and are like the oil greasing the cocks, that's the, the dream scenario that ensures that people stick to your marketplace, drives loyalty and growth in the long term. Just, just one anecdote to build on that. Huh? One of our clients in, in France, which is a food and beverage uh, marketplace, uh, wholesale. Uh, so one of the suppliers uh, on, on this marketplace actually reached out directly to, to some of the buyers to say, hey guys, if you want, we can make a yeah. deal directly. And the buyers actually... So, first of all, forwarded this, <laughs> reach out to, 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 to the platform, but replied to the supplier saying, guys, no, actually, we want to keep trading on, 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 on the platform because yeah. it makes it easier for us, you know, because, I mean, in this case, they have invested a lot also in uh, providing, you know, uh, fulfilled by operator yeah. uh, function. So, the logistics is, is combined and they, they have actually also uh, credit terms uh, that they are being granted. And, and so and so in the end, the buyer said, no, we're good with the platform. We'll, we, we, we like it. And that's the definition of product market fit. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And I mean, you have there's different again, going back to kind of I know we've established that there's an, at the base of it, there's quite a simple explanation of the marketplace, which is the, you know, a place for buyer, buyers and sellers to um, to trade but um, there's also different versions of that kind of trade for example so you've got you know people buying goods and, and and you know tangible things where the payment happens immediately or it could be deferred for, you know 30 days or something like that but then you have the other more complicated models where you've got things like kind of professional services like some of those um, freelancer platforms or you know whether it be something in the freight industry where you're transferring you know cargo that's taken like months the point is these jobs could take take months and then you've got those gaps with, you know, bet between when the, the, the buyer's paying and the seller gets paid. And, you know, can you tell me a little bit about, you know, how payments kind of works in that situation in the marketplace? Yeah, so we have exactly uh, all of this kind of uh, business model happening, you know, uh, using uh, MangoPay and maybe the freelancer, uh, the most famous one is, is Malt um, in Europe. And they use our solution very differently from people like uh, Vinted or like Chrono24. Uh, but at the end, uh, you give them the flexibility because as I said earlier, uh, 
it's really a platform. It doesn't have to be really a buyer, really a seller. It's just people that want to, to exchange and trade services and, and sometimes goods for, for real. Um, what's happening is we are, in our case, for example, the, the point of trust, uh, legally speaking, and in terms of banking, in order to enable, if I take the example of Malt, um, I'm a company and I want to use a freelancer. Uh, in between what we have built through the escrow system, which is the legal framework in order to secure the funds between the platform and the, the buyer and the seller, actually we can tell them the funds are actually secure, right? And then it's the freelancer know that he has been paid okay of course it will be fully paid only according to the terms and conditions of the platform right but both parties feel super secure that there is in the middle this marketplace malt that is uh, being guaranteeing the funds and of course behind it either you have your banking license and you are authorized to do it or you use player, players like uh, like Mango Pay, but uh, still, this is super important after assessing that your business model is going to be a platform business model, right? You really need to make sure it's not only about following the law, okay? Because it's regulated. Mm -hmm. It's also giving an experience to your user where they actually want to use your platform and not to pay themselves outside of the platform. And this is true for platform for freelancers, of course, but this is also true for rental platforms. So we have all kinds of rental platform, house, uh, cars, boats rental, even tools rentals, everything rental. <laughs> and what you want to do here is when you are renting your car or your space, you want to make sure actually that you will be paid, okay? And when you pay, you also want to make sure that you will have uh, uh, access to the car, right? If you are renting a car. So we are doing on top of the platform. So the platform is just making sure that they are scoring their users, accepting the right uh, owner of cars and, and, uh, and people that want to rent. But as our job, so we are two totally white label, so nobody sees us, but we are guaranteeing the fund so that during the transaction, nobody uh, during the transaction period uh, feel insecure to receive the funds or to receive the service, okay? And I think this is super key because the big difference with e-merchant is you are an e-merchant, you just need to propose different means of payments that will reassure your uh, buyer okay that's the first job of the mean of payment you feel confident to pay on the uh, e-commerce platform but then when you are a marketplace this is just the beginning okay then you want to know where is my money going okay and you want to make sure that behind the platform there is a player that has been recognized by the regulators by the banking infrastructure to make sure that the funds are escrow. And escrow, it's not just a small word. Uh, it totally define uh, the, the, who is the owner of the fund in real time, okay? Yeah. So it means that when I make a payment on any platform, I actually know where is my money going. And it doesn't go to the platform bank accounts because there has been so many examples when we started MangoPay 10 years ago where the platform will actually go bankrupt. And of course, uh, the seller and the buyer will never see the money. So after that, the law arrive in order to secure transaction for platform business models. So that's very key. And the last part to finish on that is because you are a marketplace and you are accepting sellers and you don't know them because it's not your own products, okay? You need to do your own scoring. This is really your knowledge normally. This is something you have to be good at doing. Who are you onboarding on your platform? And uh, the goal after that, the, the goal of Mango Pay and the regulatory obligation is to do this famous KYC 
you know, check mm -hmm. of your server. But the KYC check um, is being done in a user-friendly way, and, and this is not a big issue now uh, with the technology. But really, it's just one part of your job. As a marketplace, you cannot just trust Mango Pay to do the KYC and say, oh, I'm fine with this seller. No, you have to really build a scoring system behind. And in B2B, that's where you know where a B2B platform is being super good. Okay? They do more than just KYC. They check, okay? They check the delay of shipping. They, they check the number of refunds, okay, of the supplier. So that's really the job of, of the platform. Yeah, yeah. Um, one of the things I'd like to, just in the last kind of 10 minutes, um, we're coming up to, I'd like to sort of to dig into a little bit more is um, you're each kind of coming from, from different worlds, but, but actually you all kind of form a, a, you know, a little ecosystem together. So I'd like to understand kind of what the benefits are, you know, on the, for the B2B firms, for the marketplaces, what is the benefit in, in you guys working together in, in the three platforms together? Mark, do you want to tackle that first? Yeah, I mean the the benefit is that we 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 simply don't do the same uh, bits and pieces, right? And uh, so uh, we 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 need to work together, right? You need to assemble our technologies to actually uh, build a build a marketplace and uh, and provide a, a superior um, customer experience to 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 the buyers and the sellers. So, as with regards to Miracle, basically our software uh, facilitates uh, orders. Um, between uh, a buyer and, and a third-party seller, and uh, and as part of our ecosystem, I mean we are typically connected to to MongoPay, who uses us uh, as as the source of truth to then trigger the payments to to the sellers, right? So MongoPay, as you can imagine, before paying a seller, needs to know uh, what's what's the amount, right? Uh, uh, you know when when do they need to actually trigger uh, triggers those payments. Uh, and, and so you need to do it at scale and to manipulate a lot of information. So basically we have we have connections with 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 MongoPay. Um, and then more broadly uh, working together with with I mean with MongoPay and, and Hokodo, uh, especially during during the project phase, uh, we, we help clients, we help companies think about uh, both the tech, the compliance, also the regulatory aspect that you know Pierre and we uh, went through uh, earlier. Uh, so payment is is an absolutely fundamental uh, uh, aspect of the marketplace, precisely to set up this safe place uh, that uh, that we mentioned before. Um, so we provide uh, together this, I would say, complementary expertise, and we provide also uh, the certified connectors between our, our technologies to. To actually help launch faster, right? Yeah, no, absolutely, uh, Lucy. The reason why we do good at targeting B two B platforms together is because we don't do the same core business together. We are complementary. Okay, so if you think of layers, uh, Miracle is uh, the best at onboarding sellers and all of their catalog, and you know, fixing all of the payout rules, but they do not have the banking license. This is what we do, okay? We have the banking license to support all of the workflow on a marketplace. What we don't do, but what the B2B players need is what Louis with Vocodo is doing, okay? Is the financing part. So all together, if you think of bricks, okay? We kind of match all of the problematics that uh, B2B marketplaces uh, actually have. Uh, and where, where I think it's particularly exciting right now is that you know, digital marketplaces are a pretty recent phenomenon. You know, at the end of the day, it's only like 10 or 12 years since it's been gradually, uh, gradually increasing. And if we think about B2B marketplaces, it's only you know, five or six years before that, it was like not really heard of. So I think as an industry altogether, we've created those bricks and an ecosystem that you know, people can draw from. And we've probably covered the basics. So I think now we have a good understanding together around this table, around you know, what's required for, uh, for the trust, the payments, the compliance, the catalog to take place. And now over the coming years, 
we're going to be creating more and more convenience and value for uh, for everyone in the in that ecosystem so it, <laughs> i'm going to sound like a broken record but it's always the trust and then the convenience and the value add that you can bring and when you think of the you know b2b trade historically it's more than 50% of it has been done with payment terms and the ultimate convenience at least from a financial standpoint is that buyers pay when they want and suppliers get paid when they need it and we see lots and lots of marketplaces today where you know when credit terms so sometimes lots of marketplaces where payment terms are not offered so this piece of the convenience is missing and lots of uh, others where credit terms are offered but then the suppliers are just waiting for you know for the payments <laughs> to arrive and you know sometimes they arrive late so there's a lot that we can still engineer together to give certainty to the suppliers on their cash flows, allow them to get paid earlier, finance their inventory uh, if they want, and for the buyers to just purchase the way they've done it historically, which is you know, send me a send send me an invoice and I'll pay you in thirty or sixty days, and it's not shouldn't be more complex than that, but. Uh, Although it sounds simple on paper, getting it to work is going to take a joint effort from the likes of Miracle, Mango Pay, Hokodo over the coming years to really crack the regulatory complexity. And, and by the way, one, one, one thing Pierre said uh, a bit earlier was, I don't talk so much about marketplace, but, but digital platform or, or, or platforms. Mm. And, I, and I think it's, it's I, I totally agree because Sometimes in B2B, people have the perception that, oh, no, marketplace is not for us because it's a, it's a B2C thing and it doesn't provide everything you, you said, Louis, right, which is, you know, credit terms and, and seller financing and, and uh, you know, like working capital uh, uh, services. Uh, now, the thing is that, uh, you know, a lot has happened uh, over the past uh, couple of years. And when, when you actually bring together our complementary technologies, and we, we have that with, with joint clients, uh, actually, it's actually incredibly powerful. And we basically, uh, you know, mimic uh, the, 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 yeah, I would say the experience that uh, yeah. B2B buyers and sellers are used to have in an offline world, right? Yeah. Exactly. That was actually the question I was just going to ask. I've been I've been in B2B marketing for 20 odd years and there's been a real shift. And, you know, now we don't talk about B2B or B2C. We talk about P2P because it's always person to person, whether they're a business or a consumer. It, you know, it doesn't matter. So, um, OK, um, I'm going to wrap up um, if that's all right. But um, just to kind of recap, I suppose I picked out on four major points that you all met. And this is literally the icing on the top of the, or the tip of the iceberg, however you say it. Um, there was so much that you guys um, contributed. So thank you. But um, I have the bits I picked out was um, the kind of common mistakes or the, the things to remember is remember who you are. So the quicker that you do this, um, you know, the quicker you remember that you're there to connect buyers and sellers. You're not, you know, an e-merchant. The quicker that you can prepare your business and your operations and, and do it in the right way, get it set up from the start. The second is think with growth in mind. I really like that, what Louis said. You know, make sure that you um, think about what you need to be charging kind of, you know, with that growth scale in mind. Um, trust was the 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 word yeah, of the across day, the think. three of us <laughs> yeah literally I, I i could have earned millions if i would have charged you every time you said it but um you know security especially when it comes to payments you know keeping buyers and sellers safe and or them knowing that they're safe and their payments are safe is absolutely key so make sure you tackle this as a priority right from the start and then i think lastly the the point again that was made about adding value um and how how you can keep the business on your platform i think it's worth trying to think about that right from the start because otherwise you're building a business model where people are just going to keep you know trading offline and yeah you're just making that happen for them which is no good for anybody <laughs> so um okay hopefully i i i caught all of your um all of your thoughts there but um we're definitely going to have some follow-up in the in the future as well um where we can unpack this a little bit more so thank you very much it was uh yeah really really interesting discussion thank you very much everyone thank bang on time <laughs> <laughs> all right thanks for joining everyone bye cheers bye-bye bye-bye